tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and flesh. And the Lord said to you, You shall be shepherd of my people Israel, and you shall be prince over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. It would be hard to guess from the brevity of this passage the incredible impact that this image would have on the imagination of Israel for generations and even millennia to come. This is how things are supposed to be. This is a slice of heaven on earth. All the 12 tribes united in harmony under the righteous and obedient Davidic king, who is an image of the true God, and who establishes his capital in Jerusalem. Of course, this is the image that most people had in mind in Jesus' day of what the Messiah was to be and what his mission was to be. So much so, in fact, that when Jesus came and disappointed their worldly hopes for a political restoration of the kingdom of Israel, they had him crucified. So how do we explain the power that images like these have over our hearts and our imaginations, despite how brief they often are in history? I have three points in my sermon for us today. First, the picture of unity. Second, the pain of division. And third, the power of hope. The picture of unity. We Christians, of course, see with the benefit of hindsight that the significance of this passage of the 12 tribes gathering together to King David to make a covenant with him is actually pointing forward to something beyond itself. It's pointing to the Good Shepherd, great David's greater son, who would appoint his 12 apostles and send them out to the ends of the world to gather together his sheep. For, as he says, there will be one flock, one shepherd. If you've studied anything of Christian history, you're also aware of the substantial unity of the church through the first whole millennium of its existence. Of course, there were fights and, and schisms and heresies in the midst of it, but by and large, they held together for that first millennium. And Christians have this image, this picture of unity from that era, which is, is powerful and remains with us still, which forms our expectations for how things should be in the church. That is, the Christian emperor calling together the successors of those 12 apostles, the bishops, together in ecumenical council to define the faith handed down once for all to the saints. Now, this isn't the only picture of unity we have. Of course, we all just celebrated a big holiday on Thursday, right? With fireworks and all of that, Independence Day. What's the picture that we have, that image of unity at the birth or the foundation of our nation? It's George Washington, the president, the newly victorious general, surrounded by his 13 colonies and the representatives of those colonies united together in Congress. They offer him the crown, right? They give him the opportunity to become, if he wished, the new American royalty. But in humility, he refuses and decides to uphold the Constitution instead. This is that picture of unity that is to hold us together even to the present day. Chances are you have something like this in your own family life that shaped your expectations for how family should exist and hold together. Can you think of what it might be? Maybe it was grandma surrounded by her children and grandchildren at the holiday table or around the Christmas tree, and you thought, this is the way things should be. This is how our family should exist. 
These pictures of unity, however brief their historical existence was, have this great power over our hearts and our minds. Somehow they just can't manage to leave us. Oftentimes, however, we're not even consciously aware that they're present, that they're acting with such power until something happens, until something threatens that unity or shatters it. Which brings us to our second point, the pain of division. Which one of us here hasn't experienced painful division in their lives? Maybe it was a breakup of a marriage, a divorce or separation, your own or your parents or somebody close to you. What great pain and confusion that brings. Perhaps it was an ugly church fight that you get caught up in that you didn't ask for, but, well, came to you anyway. Maybe it's a political worry. You see the way that political administrations have been weaponizing federal, federal uh, agencies against their political opponents, and you wonder, what kind of future might this nation have for my children and grandchildren? Will it be able to hold together for another hundred years. God knows. These divisions have affected us all. I don't need to tell you that we're living in an age of division. And not one of us has escaped its ugly consequences. Pain, bitterness, and confusion. It would be bad enough if we had just been victims of this ugly situation. But the truth is that we've all contributed to it as well. Through our own sin, through our ignorance, our negligence, and our ill will, through things that we've done and things that we've left undone, we have added our own ugly piece to this broken situation. Worst of all, we tend to attempt to fix these problems and these divisions in all the wrong ways. We might, on the one hand, attempt to Uh, to make a hasty amputation, right? We build up a fortress and we say, I'm in the right, my people are in the right, and the rest of y'all can go and take a hike for all I care, right? It's very, very easy to be right, but it's also very lonely. On the other hand, we might sacrifice the truth and righteousness for the sake of completeness. We make an easy plastering over our divisions, and we say, everything is fine. It's fine. We're all the same. We're all equal. Uh, There's no problems here. Don't believe your eyes. Everything is fine. And, of course, we know how well that works out in the long term, right? If things were really fine, we'd still be in harmony with each other. We'd still have our friendships. We'd still be together, and we're not. So why do we pretend? Oh, it's because these things are easy fixes. They're shortcuts to the true unity that our Good Shepherd desires of us, that He calls us to go and pursue actively to be peacemakers. For He says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. But being a peacemaker is not easy, is it? It often gets us caught in the crossfire, it makes us the victim of all sorts of violence on either end. But it's what our Lord desires of us. How is it that we as ordinary Christians can be agents of peace in a divided age? Have you ever thought about that? But these shortcut responses are missing something that's critical for us as Christians, which is our third point, the power of hope. Have you ever wondered what the true nature of these pictures of unity are? Why is it they have such incredible power over our hearts and our imaginations? Is it, are they just brief memories of some irretrievable past? Are they just our brain's way of mythologizing the past or creating through nostalgia something that was never really there and can never be brought back again? Convinced that they're more than that. True enough, it is easy to romanticize the past. I've spoken about that before. There were, we have to be sober-minded about it, there were problems even at the height of David's kingdom that would manifest themselves within just a few years and create division. 
There were problems in the church of the first millennia that would show themselves forth in schisms and heresies and problems. There were dysfunctions in the family life that we remember as a child. And of course, there were dysfunctions in our nation's beginning as well. Within four score years and ten, those would lead to civil war and have to be resolved in the painful way. I don't want to plaster that over as though there weren't problems in these things, but there's still a power in these pictures of unity that can't be explained by their mere historical appearance. What is that? This is why. It's because these moments are a foretaste, a little advanced participation in the eternal kingdom of Christ that we as Christians confess each Sunday will have no end. There are a little foretaste of the victory of the kingdom of God, a glimpse in the mystery, uh, in, the, in the long and tra often tragic course of our history. I want to tell you about one of the most formative pictures of unity in my life. It was my experience in seminary, a place called Neshota House in southern Wisconsin. Now, Neshota House had a very unique model of seminary education. Uh, it, had, it took all of these different seminarians, usually young men, straight out of college and put them together as close as possible for three years in a little melting pot. You can kind of imagine the kinds of fights and arguments that we get into, uh, the fisticuffs that sometimes busted out in the midst of us as we came from all these different denominations and jurisdictions across the Anglican world. It was often not pretty, but it relied on Benedictine spirituality to resolve these things. It relied on this model of work, study, and prayer. Every day our life was built around daily time in the chapel, in the Holy Eucharist together, sharing meals together afterwards, sharing our studies together, and sharing in manual labor the work of our hands to build up our campus together. Now in my time sharing that experience with my fellow classmates, I learned two very important lessons. The first is that our divisions are real. There's no use covering over that fact. The things that got us into the mess that we're in are not usually so easy as a simple misunderstanding that we can clear up. Sometimes they are, but very often our conversations reveal that they're more serious than we thought they were at the first instance, rather than less serious. I realize that those divisions were real. But second, and this is more important, is that charity could be more powerful than any of these. You see, we had been practicing this way of life, this way of life that caused us to kneel together in chapel each day, to stand and praise God together each day, to pray the Lord's Prayer that God would forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us, to receive the most holy Eucharist together at the same altar rail, and then to go out and share table fellowship with one another, to work alongside one another. You know what happened that just puzzled each and every one of us? Our arguments and our struggles, which continued, by the way, became colored with the mysterious light of friendship. Suddenly we couldn't just think of these brothers and sisters alongside of us as enemies, as the other. There was somebody that Christ dearly loved just as he loved me. There is somebody that he cares about and died for. There's somebody who cares about Christ and loves Christ as much as I do, who's sincere about that, even though they disagree with me on very important points of doctrine and faith and practice. And so there is a strange conflict now suddenly in our souls that we disagreed with somebody, but more importantly, we loved them. We felt sure, we had the conviction that the more real of these two things was not the divisions, as serious as they seemed, but was our unity in Christ. 
It was the love of God for us that we were attempting to return. That was a picture of the kingdom of God that never left me. It kindled in me what they call the virtue of Christian hope, one of the three theological virtues. I don't just mean the sort of hope that's, you know, the the easy sense of saying, I hope that things will be better someday. I hope that we'll all be together someday soon. No, that's cheap. I'm talking about the virtue of hope, which is the power of perseverance no matter how difficult situations and circumstances become. The virtue of hope doesn't say, I hope things will be better. It says, I know that one day the unity of the kingdom of God will be the reality that we all are experiencing and enjoying. I know that one day Christ's kingdom will appear in its glory, and this will be the thing that overcomes all pain and all divisions. And so I can persevere with patience and humility and love to make as much of that a reality in my daily life as possible now. Hope was the greatest gift of my seminary experience. It meant that I didn't have to accept the divisions, the ugly, painful breakups of this world as the final reality, as something inevitable or irreversible. I wonder how many of us have fallen into the trap of thinking that our divisions have the final word that we just give up. What greater tragedy is that when Christians cease to hear the Good Shepherd's voice, that they all may be one. When Christians give up on our enemies or on our political opponents or on people from other folds and say, well, it's not worth my time. I won't even bother arguing with them anymore. To heck with them. What a tragedy. Do you have anything like that in your life? Any family relationships that have suffered a a nasty breakup? Somebody that you're not talking to? Somebody that the last word that you had with them was one of ugliness and sin? Who is that person that God is calling you to reach across the aisle to, to make the first humiliating step? It's something for us to think about. So again, what is our task as ordinary Christians to heal the divisions of our age? Chances are, of course, that it's not, you know, we're not going to become senators or representatives in Congress or presidents of the United States. Chances are none of us will become a bishop, God willing, to make the kinds of global changes uh, that we often think are are the things that really need to happen. But what we can do is strive with patient hope to bring about a glimpse of that final victory and unity of the kingdom of God in our families, in our communities, and in this parish. These are the things that God has placed within our immediate reach, which he has called us to do something about. And that begins by us taking our participation in the Eucharistic liturgy seriously. Why do I say that? It's because the Eucharistic feast is the ultimate picture of unity. It's the thing that all those other pictures are ultimately pointing to. Right? Instead of David in his capital of Jerusalem, surrounded by the 12 tribes in their political but temporary unity, what do we have? We see the successors of the Twelve apostles, all of the church militants and triumphant, joined together around the altar to the Good Shepherd, great David's greater son, to be united with him, to place unity with the kingdom of heaven first in their lives, to join together with one voice in praise of God Almighty, to sing in unity and in harmony, to find our place in the cosmic drama of redemption that is unfolding around us to take our part in that. We're training ourselves through liturgy, through ritual, to find out what it means to be in unity with others. 
And when we have that ingrained in us, when we take that seriously, when that peace is descended into our hearts, when we become reconciled to God and our neighbors, then we can take that out of this building. We can bring it into coffee hour and reach across to people that we've never met before and form relationships with them. We can open up our tables to one another. We can work and serve God together with each other. We can even reach out to those people that annoy us or (laughs) that we would ordinarily consider our enemies because we've been praying for them in church. We've been seeking that unity and that peace of God. And God calls us through patient, persevering hope to bring a glimpse of the kingdom into the world. Yes, it may be short. It might be brief. No more than a generation, perhaps. But it will be something that can give the world hope that in the end, peace and unity will reign under Christ, the true King. May it be so. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.